This video looks at the 1960s and what's happening around America outside of the civil rights movement. And the 1960s really starts with JFK being elected president in 1961. His main competitor was Richard Nixon, who was the outgoing vice president for Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, JFK, his domestic programs that he has, they're, they're not very successful. And that's because it was almost like too much too quickly. There's this coalition of Republicans and conservative Democrats who kind of push back on anything that Kennedy tries to do domestically, whether that be civil rights, voting rights, you name it. So Kennedy has to find something that everybody can get along with, and that is strengthening the economy. Now, Kennedy is going to strengthen the economy by increasing military spending and giving tax incentives to businesses. The military spending is going to be used to combat the Soviet Union. It's going to be used to stop communism. Tax incentives are going to be used to encourage businesses to grow. And then there are going to be some tax cuts thrown in there as well. While JFK is president, uh, the Congress is going to pass the Clean Air Act to help regulate the environment. That's done in 1963. And then Kennedy's plan for his second term is to go ahead and try and tackle civil rights. Uh, he never gets a chance, though, because on November 22nd, 1963, while campaigning in Dallas, Texas, JFK is assassinated. After John F. Kennedy is Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, he's going to become the president after the murder of JFK. And he's going to pick up where JFK left off. And a lot of this is because of all that goodwill and all of that shock that came from JFK being assassinated and the government just wants to do what JFK wanted. So the tax cut that Kennedy was going to propose for his second term is passed. All the civil rights initiatives that JFK was going to plan for his second term are passed. So in 1964, taxes are cut by over $10 billion. The economy goes skyrocket. The federal deficit's reduced because of it. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's gonna outlaw segregation in public facilities. It's gonna strengthen the federal power to combat uh, racial injustice and racial disenfranchise, the disenfranchisement. And it's also going to strengthen the federal power to increase or speed up school desegregation. Another thing that LBJ does is he reads a book by Michael Harrington called The Other America. The Other America was published in 1962. And in this book, Harrington talks about how, um, how much of America is in poverty. Um, even though, you know, as you saw in the 1950s video, the affluent society, that didn't translate to everybody. By the time we get into the 1960s, more than 20% of Americans are under the poverty line. And Michael Harrington's going to explore and report and research what this experience of poverty is like. As a result of reading this book, LBJ is going to declare a war on poverty. And he's going to begin a $1 billion campaign to help bring Americans into the economic mainstream. And to do this, he's going to have Congress pass the Economic Opportunity Act that creates the Job Corps. Uh, he's going to create Project Head Start, which gives kids an early start on their education. Many of you may have gone to a Head Start program that is an outgrowth of this. To help with, with uh, education at an upper level, 
LBJ is going to encourage Congress to pass Pell Grants. He's also going to create Medicare, Medicaid, give money to public housing, give public to mass transit as well. And this is going to become known as LBJ's Great Society. It's a great plan. It is forward thinking. But there are problems. LBJ is going to fail ultimately. Now, much of the reason LBJ's plan doesn't work is because number one, it's over ambitious. Number two, it was very expensive. And number three, the federal government did not work with state governments or local governments. A lot of what the federal government wants to do, they don't coordinate with local communities. And local governments refuse to cooperate with the housing authority, the transit planning ideas. And Atlanta is a great example of how local governments and federal governments did not mix. Uh, if you've ever been driving through Atlanta or you know, being from Atlanta, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Georgia 400 on the north side. Interstate 675 on the south side were originally supposed to connect. It was supposed to be an interstate. Problem is, it would have torn down some historic Atlanta neighborhoods and those communities refused to leave their homes. The Lakewood Freeway in West Atlanta, that is Highway uh, 166 once you get to uh, 285. And the Stone Mountain Freeway on the other side of 285 going towards well, Stone Mountain that was supposed to be a freeway as well. Parts of that freeway were supposed to be a Freedom Parkway. It was supposed to start in downtown Douglasville. Just imagine an interstate going through downtown Douglasville pretty much right where the mall is. That was supposed to be Interstate 420 that went all the way from Douglasville on the south side of Atlanta back up into downtown Atlanta and then out where Stone Mountain is. But once again, the local governments were not, us. they weren't spoken to. The local people didn't want it. And so the project failed. Those projects that are put in place, they're basically just skeleton crews. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid were supposed to have a lot more money than what they actually got. And a lot of the reason that the funding was so scarce was because the money was sucked away by the war in Vietnam. Now, Medicare does still exist today. It provides health care for the elderly and health care for those who have some sort of um, disability. Medicaid still exists. It's for those who are young or poor. And then you also have the National Endowment for the Arts that is a surviving part of this great society. There are some student movements that happen and these are sometimes related to the, the civil rights movement, but more often than not, these student movements are related to the Vietnam War. So you got SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. It's founded in 1962. And it demands an end to the war in Vietnam that has just got started, more participation and more ability to speak their mind as part of democracy. And from this, then, you get this new left movement, what it's called, and a free speech movement, 1963, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, students are going to demand the right for free speech on campus, the right to express their political views on campus. Students are gonna have clashes with university administrators. The, the then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, is going to publicly complain about these students. And the University of California, Berkeley, in many ways becomes the home of the student movement. Even the University of West Georgia here in Carrollton had a branch of SDS and during the Vietnam War, there was a student protest on the West Georgia campus where students wrote a petition demanding an end to the war, marched to downtown Carrollton and delivered it to the mayor of Carrollton demanding that the Carrollton mayor end the war now. 
Now, eventually, the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, and the free speech movement, they come together. New chapters of SDS are formed all across the country. And there are sit-ins, there are rallies, there are campus takeovers to protest racism, protest the military, and protest the draft. In 1967, there are over 500,000 students who attend a march against the Vietnam War in New York City. And then two years later, in 1969, another 300,000 students attend a march in Washington, D.C. also to protest the war. In 1970, the country of Cambodia was invaded by the United States and mass protests break out across the country for that. The most famous of these 1970 mass protests uh, occurs at Kent State University. And at Kent State University, uh, students are protesting and demonstrating against the war. The Ohio National Guard is sent out and the students are told if they don't leave, they will be fired upon. The students don't leave. The Ohio National Guard opens fire four students are killed and ironically the four students killed were not even involved in the mass protest they were innocent bystanders jackson state university in mississippi a protest breaks out there and two students are killed on the campus of jackson state university by the mississippi highway patrol now many of these students condemn and blame the president in 1970 richard nixon but older Americans begin to blame students for causing the problems. By the time we get to 1971, SDS is falling apart because of all these protests and all the pushback that the students are receiving. And some of these members of SDS are gonna go underground and form a terrorist organization called Weather Underground. Now, not all SDS members do that. Many of them have just gotten older they graduate college, they begin families, and many who participated in the student movement begin voting and trying to change the world through the ballot box. The 1960s is also the period of the rock and roll generation, and in the 1960s, rock and roll was seen as the music of the counterculture, music of the rebellion. And this rock and roll generation, their big claim was peace, love, and understanding. And that becomes the theme of the younger generation. Uh, drug experimentation, sexual experimentation becomes widely accepted. 1969 is known as the summer of love because of those two things. The rock and roll generation, it's like the anti-silent generation. The, the young people of the 1960s are revolting against their parents and what they experienced in the 1950s. So music, completely different. Hairstyles, completely different. Dress, completely different. Drug use, completely different. And rock and roll, as you probably know, is going to develop into subgenres. You've got Beatlemania, led by the Beatles. Uh, you've got Hard Rock by The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, and then you've got Psychedelic Rock, best seen by The Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane. Now the high point of the rock and roll generation uh, is easily the Woodstock Musical Festival that happens in August of 1969. Um, there's going to be 300,000 people that attend that festival, and it is like the perfect example of what's going to happen uh, long hair beards tie-dyed t-shirts torn jeans drug use sex it's all there in woodstock the biggest acts of the day all perform at woodstock pretty much anybody who was a big band in 1968 1969 is at woodstock The 1960s sees a greater sexual openness. I've mentioned that already, but a lot of that is because for the first time, birth control becomes widely available. What we know today is a birth control pill is available in 1960. 
a Supreme Court case, Griswold versus Connecticut in 1963, makes the use of birth control legal in every state. 1973, Roe versus Wade makes abortions legal nationwide, even though they'd already been okay in some states, just not all. There are adult themes in, in bookstores, adult themes in movie theaters, adult bars, all become more acceptable and more popular. This then spreads to Broadway. In fact, the musical Hair ends the first act with the entire cast naked on set. It becomes common for unmarried people to live together. Um, even though in many states that was considered a felony, it's not prosecuted anymore. And I would dare say un unmarried people living today is probably just as common as married people living today. For the first time in the 1960s, homosexual begins to become accepted and that acceptance has just increased and increased and increased to where we are today. And surprisingly, birth rates drop during the sexual revolution primarily because of birth control. Now there are many Americans who celebrate this revolution, but there's just as many that don't approve. In the late 1960s, beginning of the 1970s, conservatism starts to increase. There are people who are worried about the moral compass of this country and there are an increasing number of people who begin to vote for conservative leaders who promised a return to traditional values that were originally found in the 1950s. Now, in reality, the sexual revolution is gonna last all through the, the 60s, all through the 70s, and it comes to a screeching halt in the early 80s when the threat of AIDS uh, is introduced into society. Now specifically we have to look at 1968 and this video it's it's not going to be enough it's not going to be soon enough for you to try to do an SLO overnight but I do need to make sure that you understand how important 1968 is for our country. There are so many events that happen and historians have frequently said that 1968 is the closest that the United States has come to a revolution since the Revolutionary War. Well, what happens that makes it so important? Well, in 1968, the year starts January 23rd, when the USS Pueblo, a, an intelligence ship, is captured off the coast of North Korea. Um, the USS Pueblo, I've done a lot of studies on this. I have a personal connection to this ship. Um, it was collecting electronic intelligence off the coast of North Korea. It was in international waters when it was attacked by surprise. The crew was captured, taken hostage, and the crew was held for 11 months as captives of North Korea under very, very poor conditions. Uh, torture, beatings, lack of food, you name it. And the crew is held all the way from January 23rd, 1968 until December 23rd, 1968. There's a mass movement demanding that LBJ get the ship back by force. There's a mass movement demanding that LBJ negotiate and get the crew released. The National Guard is called up in preparation for war with North Korea, but it never happens. M large part because of the next incident which was the Tet Offensive. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the Vietnam War section, but the Tet Offensive is launched by North Vietnam on January 31st. It's a surprise attack on more than 100 cities throughout South Vietnam. Uh, up to this point, up to the beginning of January 1968, the US government had been telling the American people that the war is almost over. The United States is winning. Uh, North Vietnam is on its last legs and that the United States has defeated and beaten North Vietnam militarily. 
Well, what was happening is secretly North Vietnam had been planning this Tet Offensive for over a year. And on January 31st, during the Lunar New Year, over a hundred cities are attacked at once. Much of it's caught on film and in news reports. And for the first time, the American government realizes, or the American people have been realized, the government been lying to them. And the American people don't trust the government anymore after the failure of the Tet Offensive. In March of 1968, we have the My Lai Massacre. Um, Charlie Company goes to the village of My Lai. They're told that Viet Cong enemy soldiers are there, but instead all they find are men, women, and children. Even though that these are just old men, women, and children, the villagers, they're still rounded up. They're still interrogated. And then they're systematically raped, shot, and killed. The village is burned, the drinking water is poisoned, the food is destroyed, and if not for helicopter pilot Hugh Thompson putting his helicopter in between Charlie Company and the surviving villagers, it would have been even worse. The only reason that the government found out about this, because the army completely covered it up, is one man, Ron Ridnauer wrote a letter to Congress, included pictures of what happened. Miraculously, only one person was charged in this massacre, William Calley, Lieutenant of Charlie Company. He never actually served jail time. He just served house arrest. April, April 4th, Memphis, Tennessee. Martin Luther King Jr. has gone to Tennessee to help sanitation workers receive better pay and better equipment. On the evening of April 4th, outside the Lorraine Motel, James Earl Ray opens fire and shoots Martin Luther King Jr. hitting him in the head. He dies on the scene. Once word comes out that this has happened, Riots erupt across the nation. Over 60 cities have riots. Over 27,000 are arrested. The only major city not to have rioting that night was Indianapolis, Indiana. And that's because Robert F. Kennedy was there on a campaign stop because he was running for president in 1968. And he gave one of the greatest speeches. I've got the video here if you want to watch it. Uh, when you look at this PowerPoint. But basically, what Robert F. Kennedy says, I understand your pain. My brother was killed by an assassin. I know what it's like. And he urges the people of Indianapolis to have restraint. But Robert F. Kennedy himself just a little bit more than two months later, he is assassinated. On June 6th, 1968, Robert F. Kennedy has just won the Democratic primary in California. And he's at the Ambassador Hotel. He has given his victory speech. It's almost 100% for sure that Robert F. Kennedy will be the Democratic nominee for president. Once he's done giving his speech, he goes out of the room and he's going to cut through a, a kitchen to get to his room where he's staying. And he's shot point blank by a Palestinian named Sirhan Sirhan who didn't like what Robert F. Kennedy had said about Palestine and Israel. Kennedy had promised to end the Vietnam War. Kennedy had promised to further the civil rights movement. Kennedy was going to pick up where MLK had left off because Kennedy and King were friends. When Kennedy 
was killed. It was almost like the civil rights movement in many ways was killed with him. It took a death blow and was on life support after MLK, but after RFK was assassinated, the civil rights movement's over. The promises of ending the Vietnam War are over. And just like riots broke out after the assassination of Martin Luther King, riots broke out after the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Moving on to August of 1968, you have the Democratic National Convention, where the Democratic Party is going to name their candidate for president. Tens of thousands of protesters swarm the streets of Chicago. The mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley, has promised that this convention will continue come hell or high water. The Democratic Party is in shambles. LBJ, who had said months ago he would not run for president again, suddenly wants to run for president. Robert F. Kennedy was still massively supported, even though he was dead. Another guy, Eugene McCarthy, he had support. Hubert Humphrey had support. George McGovern enters the race at the last minute. Nobody knows what's going to happen. There are so many different factions, so many different people who want to be the Democratic national candidate. And just like riots broke out in Chicago, just like riots had broken out throughout the country, a riot breaks out at the Democratic National Convention, both inside the convention and outside the convention. In the streets of Chicago, the riot was led by police. Over 12,000 policemen and National Guardsmen are given permission to shoot to kill, to use open violence on any protesters. And historians now say that Chicago, August 1968, was a police-led riot. These are just some of the events. There are still more things that happened. The 1968 Olympics with the Black Power symbol. The Apollo mission to the moon for the first time. 1968 was just a mess. I also just want to talk real briefly about the Vietnam War. And a lot of this is kind of world history stuff, but I, I really want you to know where the Vietnam War comes from. Um, first Europeans are going to reach Vietnam in 1498, and Vietnam is basically going to be used like a rest stop on the interstate or a gas station. Um, Vietnam is going to be used to replenish supplies for ships going between Africa and China. But wherever the Europeans go, Jesuits and Catholicism are going to follow and as early as 1616 the Vietnamese are being converted to Christianity. In 1771 there's going to be a revolt that happens in Vietnam. There's going to be the Vietnamese Emperor versus the Taesan brothers. Uh, Nguyen An, who is the heir to the throne, asked the French for help defending from the rebellion. The Taesan brothers are going to ask China for help. So you've got Nguyen versus the Taesans. You've got France versus China. France and Nguyen An win this revolt. And as a result, the French start asking the Vietnamese for concessions. And by 1883, because of these concessions, Vietnam's completely under French control and the Vietnamese do not like it. Almost as soon as the French take over, there's this movement that develops called Loyalty to the King. And from 1885 to 1895, the Loyalty to the King movement tries to restore the Vietnamese Emperor to power. The former Emperor is captured by the French, and the French take complete control. Now, the French were nice enough to put a pretend Emperor on the throne but that emperor of Vietnam had no power whatsoever. Well, when we get to 1916, this is in the middle of World War I, the emperor at that time, he was a 16-year-old kid named Duy Tan, 
Doitan sneaks out of the the palace, begins a rebellion against the French, and then this rebellion is defeated. Well, what does this have to do with the United States history? Well, it's, it really starts here with Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh is born in 1890, and his dad is a government official who works for the French. Ho Chi Minh is well-educated, and from 1919 to 1923, Ho Chi Minh is actually in Paris during the Versailles Peace Conference. And if you remember from the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, one of Woodrow Wilson's points was to let the people of the world make up their own minds what's going to happen. And Ho Chi Minh is in Paris hoping that Woodrow Wilson is going to fight for the Vietnamese people to have their independence. It doesn't happen though. France is able to keep Vietnam as a colony. And Ho Chi Minh is going to become one of the founders of both the French Communist Party and the Indochina. Communist Party. During World War II, Vietnam falls under Japanese control and Japan uses Vietnam for all the resources and all the food. Ho Chi Minh is going to fight against the Japanese and Ho Chi Minh is going to get help from the United States. The United States is going to provide Ho Chi Minh with supplies and troops and weapons and training. Now, in 1945, right before Jap Japan is going to surrender, Japan actually gives Vietnam its independence. And on August 28, 1945, Japanese forces surrender to Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh declares the Democratic Republic of Vietnam independent. Now that's going to lead to something called the First Indochina War, and this is a nine year long war. When World War II is over, even though Japan has surrendered to the Vietnamese, European powers once again ignore Vietnamese independence. France says we never gave up the colony. France returns, sets up a new government. At the same time, Ho Chi Minh is trying to set up, set up his government. And a fight breaks out. Now, Ho Chi Minh's plan to unite Vietnam, he wants to, number one, win support of the people. Number two, get supplies from allies, in this case, Russia and China. He wants to start rebellions, keep the French working. And then he wants to fight the French in one decisive battle. Well, he gets his wish. In 1953, a rebellion starts in the neighboring country of Laos. And Ho Chi Minh's number one general, Vo Nguyen Giap, is going to attack a French base called Dien Bien Phu. Dien Bien Phu is basically in a valley completely surrounded by mountains, and for whatever reason, the French thought that the valley floor was the absolute best place to put a military base. In reality, it was the worst. Now, this is where the United States gets directly involved in Vietnam. The French and the Vietnamese agree that in 1956 that elections will happen to decide whether Vietnam would be communist or not. And those elections don't happen because the pro-French Vietnamese in the South declare itself a country. So now we suddenly have two Vietnams. We've got South Vietnam, which is pro-French, supposedly democratic, even though it was anything but. And then you have the Northern Democratic um, Republic of Vietnam, which was not democratic, it was communist. So we've got two Vietnams, neither one is democratic, one is supported by the communists, one is not. Now this new country of South Vietnam is seen as a new domino in that whole communist theory. We want to stop communist dominoes from falling. So the United States pledges to protect South Vietnam. The United States 
promises aid to South Vietnam. It's a way to contain communism, which if you remember, was the name of the game during the Cold War. Once the communist North realizes that elections are not going to happen, uh, these guerrilla soldiers, these underground secret soldiers known as the Viet Cong, begin to launch attacks throughout South Vietnam. And before you know it, a second war begins. In 1961, John F. Kennedy publicly announces plans to support South Vietnam to help it maintain its independence. This meant sending more aid, more money, more troops. In December 1961, the very first U.S. troop arrives. One year later, there's 11,000 troops in Vietnam. Now, none of these are considered combat troops. They're, called, they're just advisors. They're there to train the army of South Vietnam and help them in battle. But in reality, what's happening on the battlefield, the army of South Vietnam is losing everything, every single war, every single battle. The war between North Vietnam and South Vietnam is going so bad that in 1963, there's a rebellion against the government of South Vietnam. The president, if you can call him that, of South Vietnam, Go Dinh Diem, is going to round up all the Buddhists, arrest the Buddhists, call them communists, and then kill them all. The situation gets so bad in South Vietnam that on November 1st, 1963, the United States secretly helps the South Vietnam military overthrow Go Dinh Diem. Go Dinh Diem and his brother are murdered. South Vietnam, if you can't tell, it's not exactly stable. In fact, from November 1963 to July of 1965, there are more than 10 different governments that are set up and fall in South Vietnam. The Gulf of Tonkin incident, very, very important. When LBJ comes to power in November of 1963 after the, the death of John F. Kennedy, he wants to increase the US involvement in Vietnam. LBJ was extremely, extremely hardcore anti-communist. So in March of 1964, he secretly authorizes something called Operation 34 and Operation 30, 35. These are going to be coastal raids on the coast of North Vietnam. U.S. Navy ships loaded full of South Vietnamese Marines will secretly attack places along the beach of North Vietnam in the middle of the night. Well, on August 4th of 1964, there are two U.S. destroyers, the USS Maddox and the USS Turner Joy, who are supposedly attacked by North Vietnamese naval ships. Never been proven. There was no physical damage to the ships. Nobody saw a North Vietnamese boat. No evidence of the attack other than intercepted radio signals. And quite frankly, intercepted radio signals can be faked. Regardless, August 7th, LBJ goes to Congress and asks for a permission to use military force in Vietnam. And the Gulf of Tonkin resolution is the result of that. On March 2nd, 1965, Operation Rolling Thunder began, the first offensive military action the United States takes in Vietnam. In less than one month, from March 2nd, 1965 to March 31st, 1965, the United States drops 4 million tons worth of bombs on South Vietnam, 3 million tons worth of bombs on the neighboring country of Laos, 1 million tons of bombs on the enemy, North Vietnam, and half a million tons of bombs on Cambodia. Now just look at those numbers, 4 million tons of bombs on the people you're protecting, South Vietnam. American combat troops arrive. The very first combat troop arrives March 8, 1965. 3,500 U.S. Marines storm the beach at the city of Da Nang, and they're greeted by local women who put lays, you know, flower necklaces on them. 
wouldn't be so bad until you realize that these 3,500 US Marines do a World War II style combat landing on the beach with their guns and their bayonets and their weapons drawn. By the end of 1965, there are 200,000 combat troops in Vietnam. And by 1968, there's 550,000 combat troops in Vietnam. And South Korea is going to add another 200,000 to that. There are almost a million troops in Vietnam that are either U.S. troops or U.S. ally troops. The Tet Offensive, which I mentioned a minute ago. Um, from February of 1965 until early 1968, basically the United States had won every battle that it had been involved in. And there is some truth to the fact that the United States was on the verge of winning. But the North Vietnamese, they weren't looking for a military victory. They were looking for a psychological victory. So even though the Tet Offensive is ultimately going to be a failure, yes, there are coordinated att attacks on more than 100 cities. And no, the massive uprising that North Vietnam was looking for never happens. It is a psychological victory. America and the American people distrust the government. And the U.S. government decides the only way we can possibly end this war is to negotiate. We can't win. We can just, at best, fight to a draw. When Richard Nixon is elected president in 1969, he does so on the promise that he would reduce the number of troops in Vietnam. August of 1969, 25,000 U.S. troops leave. Another 65,000 are gone by March of 1970. The United States is removing troops from Vietnam, but the North Vietnamese government refuses to negotiate to end the war because North Vietnam thinks that they're winning the psychological battle. When the United States public learns that U.S. combat troops have invaded Cambodia in April 1970, the United States people accuse Richard Nixon of lying. They say that Nixon, even though he campaigned on ending the war, he's expanding the war to new places and new people. And that's why those war protests like the one at Jackson State and Kent State happen. By the time we get to 1971, more and more U.S. troops are being removed. The South Vietnamese Army is doing more and more of the fighting. But it's the U.S. Air Force. They're still the ones controlling the skies. As war protests break out in the United States, it becomes harder and harder for the United States government to maintain the war. In 1964, SDS comes out. College students rally against the war. At first, these college students were seen as being un-American and unpatriotic. But the anti-war movement grows and gets bigger and gets bigger and gets bigger. April of 1967, there's that 500,000 strong anti-war demonstration. October of 1967, there's 100,000 people who demonstrate against the war in Washington, D.C. Even Vietnam War veterans coming back from Vietnam are against the war. And they form something called the Vietnam Veterans Against the War Organization and they publicly talk about what's happening in Vietnam. Some of these veterans who come back are actively stopping people before they go on military bases for basic training saying, here's what you're getting into. Here's what's going to happen. In 1972, Richard Nixon's going to hold secret negotiations with North Vietnam. South Vietnam has no idea that these negotiations are occurring. And on January 23rd, 1973, the United States and the communist North Vietnamese government reach a ceasefire. And it's agreed that all U.S. forces will be removed from Vietnam by March 31st, less than two months after the agreement is signed. 
there's going to be a complete end of hostilities, a withdrawal of all U.S. forces, and a return of all prisoners. South Vietnam is shocked. They feel like their partner, their best friend, has lied to them and pulled the wool out from underneath them. The peace negotiations allow 150,000 North Vietnamese troops to remain in South Vietnam. And almost as soon as U.S. troops are out, the fighting resumes. By 1975, the South Vietnamese government, they've lost control of all of their major cities. And by April 30th, the capital city, Saigon, falls to communist forces. And at the last minute, hundreds of people are, ha are forced to be helicoptered out of the city for fear of their life. All right, long video after this. We've only got one more left for next week. And then we got the final. So good luck. Any questions on the SLO, anything, email, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. See you later. Bye.